All right, well, um, <clears throat> so I am Deanna Pennington. I'm a physical geographer by training and my expertise is in human environmental systems. Um, I've been collaborating with computer scientists since 2001 um, in a whole variety of contexts. But one of those contexts was in, started in 2003. I was, joined a large ITR research grant. Um, many of you may remember the ITR program. Uh, and despite the fact that we were very well funded, that we were all very motivated, we all um, were very excited, we really struggled with generating the kind of synergistic results that we had hoped for. Uh, there was pl plenty of good research going on, but it was mostly going on um, within individual research plans and not really integrated across disciplines. So um, I looked really hard for, I figured people had been studying teams for a long time and I looked really hard for help in the issues we were running into. And I found that nobody had really studied research teams. So I started studying research teams as human environmental systems. And that took me down a really uh, different path than what I had ever thought I would be doing. So I wanna tell you a little bit about that, the work that I'm doing there. But before I get there, I want to provide some context for why I think this is important and why, um, uh, why it's hard to do. So, uh, whoops. So the agenda is first, I wanna talk about this new phrase that NSF is pushing, convergent research, and how that fits with our uh, understanding of interdisciplinarity. Uh, I'll talk about the challenges that arise in trying to do convergent research. Uh, then I'm gonna focus in on knowledge integration and synthesis, because that's the area that I do my research in. And it's directly re relevant to uh, ISGO because uh, we are trying to integrate data and tools, and the reality is that integration has to happen in your mind first <laughs> before you can ever do any of the technical work that we're trying to do. Um, and then I have a couple of slides on data science education. So this is NSF's, uh, their, their, this is from their website on where they talk about convergent research. As you know, they have the 10 big ideas that they came up with for the next decade, one of which is growing convergent research. And so it helps to know what convergent research is if you're gonna grow it. So they say it's research driven by a specific and compelling problem, and that it requires a deep integration across disciplines. And they define that as intermingling knowledge, theories, methods, data, uh, community languages, and with the goal of generating new frameworks, paradigms, or even new disciplines. Their example of uh, convergent research is the bio field of bioinformatics, uh, which uh, began back in the early 90s with the commu community of um, genomics people, partnering with data mining people, and of course, we all know what that led to. It's interesting to note that those two communities did not set out to become a new discipline. Uh, they grew that, you know, it took a decade to grow into that. Um, so convergent research is not something that you can expect to sit around the table and say, oh, we're gonna do convergent research. It's something that you have to grow and evolve. So in order to understand that, there's some other terms you need to know about. Uh, disciplinary research, if, if the black dots are individual researchers and the white dots are their research goals, this is an illustration of disciplinary research, everybody's doing their own thing. Multidisciplinary, everybody's doing their own thing the same way they've always done it, but they're doing it under some sort of thematic umbrella. And usually there's some sort of seminar or something where they share information. Interdisciplinary depends on having a shared research goal that everybody is contributing to, and there are linkages between the, research, the researchers. Um, maybe they're passing data back and forth, maybe they're working on different aspects of the problem, um, but so interdisciplinary depends on generating the shared vision of your research goal. Transdisciplinary is used two ways. One of them is the bioinformatics example where they started out working on a shared research problem and eventually they generated completely new frameworks and a, and a new discipline. The other way transdisciplinary is used in the literature is by involving people outside of academia, uh, other stakeholders in the research process. 
So uh, NSF, when they're talking about this, they reference this National Research Council report that came out a few years ago. Um, they say that it, their view of convergent research is most like transdisciplinary research, that it might or might not include stakeholders. Um, the way I like to think about it is that multi inter and transdisciplinary describes the structure of the team, but convergence is a process. You, you converge on a solution from multiple perspectives. So convergence really focuses on the outcomes that you're after and not so much on how is the team structured. So it, as I mentioned, it's a developmental process. You have to start multidisciplinary. There's no place else to start. And then you build those connections across disciplines through time. And eventually you can end up in a transdisciplinary context, but it takes time to get there. So NSF says uh, convergence research is a means of solving research problems, in particular complex problems focusing on societal needs. So what are those societal needs? Well, um, you may or may not have been familiar with this, but the United Nations in 2015 came up with a list of 17 goals that they hope to achieve by 2030 which as you will note is only 12 years away. Um, and these are really tough, hard problems. Um, I've highlighted clean water because I think that there are a number of us that are working on, on water issues that are very complex. If you look at freshwater resources globally in 1995, really there were some semi-arid and arid regions that had uh, freshwater issues that is expected to expand pretty dramatically by 2025. And the UN is, is saying that they expect that there will be up to 7 billion people impacted by that change. Um, so when we start looking at that as a socio-environmental system, getting clean and available water cuts across all sorts of different disciplines. You have to understand the environmental problems behind it, the hydrology, the, uh, the um, physical science, you have to understand uh, the eco economics of whatever it is that you're trying to change because it doesn't matter how environmentally friendly your solution is, if it's not economically desirable, it won't, it won't ever be adopted. Uh, and then there's also society that you have to worry about. Um, sometimes society, you have to understand the social activities that are causing the problems, but then there's also an impact of the problems on society. So these are considered the three pillars of sustainability science, environmental, economy, and society. Uh, and these kinds of problems have been referred to as wicked problems, not wicked in terms of evil problems, but wicked in terms of wicked hard problems. Uh, they're highly complex, they're very uncertain, you don't ever really know what your end goal is. Um, they're value laden, they depend on pulling together information from across a, a lot, large spectrum of, of knowledge. Um, and they are not the kinds of problems that we get trained in, yeah, in academia. Um, we were trained very well how to solve um, disciplinary problems. But when you start working on these kinds of problems, there's a whole set of skills that you have to have that most of us don't start out with. So my project that I'm working on right now is funded by the USDA. We're modeling water resources in the Rio Grande region, trying to figure out um, with stakeholders in the community how we might be able to um, survive the coming decades and keep our water resources intact. It is a very semi-arid region, so um, we, water scarcity is a problem. There are lots of other issues with uh with our water in terms of its quality um, but you can see this is just like a partial list of the people we have involved in this project they come from engineering physical science and social science um, multiple disciplines in each of those arenas um, and so this is a really a good example of a wicked problem and what it takes to be able to pull pull it off and so this is the notion of convergent research. We want to be able to converge on some solutions across these different perspectives and including stakeholders in the community. Um, and you can imagine it's a very tense subject because 
Uh, agriculture uses 75% of the water, but the, the farmers, they're the ones that have the water rights and they do not want to give up those rights. And at the same time, like most cities, El Paso is a growing, the whole region is growing. Um, and so there's this tension between uh, how we use our water resources. Well, ISGO is working on many people, of many people in this group are working on these wicked sustainability problems. Um, for example, Yolanda's Mint Project is working on water resources in Africa. Um, Suzanne is, has a project called Planet Texas. It's working on water in the east half of um, Texas. Mary Hill has work, is working on food, energy, and water problems. Uh, so we, there's no shortage of really complicated problems that we're trying to tackle that require convergence across a lot of perspectives. Um, However, it, you know, those are not the best place to start trying to learn how to do convergence. There are plenty of simpler problems that can be very challenging, just even partnering one earth scientist with one data scientist in trying to make progress. And Joe and Emmy and Suzanne and I uh, wrote a paper last semester uh, talking about earth data science education and really thinking about how tough it is, what, what such a, how much, how complicated it is, you have to know enough about each of them to be able to ever move forward. So I mentioned that I've been looking at this as the team itself as, an, as a complex socio-environmental system. Teams uh, persist in an environment that has different scales that, uh, of influence, everything from uh, within an individual on the team and the other pressures and time constraints that they have, to socio-political and institutional factors that impact how well the team functions. Any system uh, is, <coughs> excuse me, let me get a drink of water before I cough. <laughs> so any team, any system is comprised of system components. A team is no different than that. We have people, we have uh, collaboration tools, we have data, we have resources, uh, technical resources that we bring to the table. But a system is not a system because of the components. A system is a system because of the interactions between those components. And so the interactions that are of interest in, in these kinds of um, research teams are that you really need a different kind of leadership than what we, most of us have, have been in, involved with. Top-down leadership does not work on these kinds of problems. It's got to be a bottom-up organic style of leading that in, in, encourages everybody to participate and empowers people to move forward. The ability to learn each other's perspectives is, it's, is critical. You can't generate an integrated shared vision unless you understand enough about each other's perspectives to figure out what that would look like. Um, development of connections across disciplines, and these are not necessarily even research connections, just finding things that resonate across disciplines and that maybe have parallel um, uh, methods, even if they're called something different, uh, that helps you formulate the, your system connections and, and that will help you generate uh, better research connections. And then adaptability and flexibility. People who have something very specific they want to work on usually don't do very well in these kinds of teams um, because you have to be adaptable and flexible. So the important thing here is that once you can get your team acting like a system, be, being a system, then you get emergence of system level properties. And this is what you're really after. You, that shared vision is an emergent property. Convergence is an emergent property. Um, aligned research goals and new conceptual frameworks, those all emerge from the interactions within this cognitive system. There are other things that come out of uh, the system, uh, other products, um, in particular from, from a team functioning standpoint, social ties are really important. Um, you also may generate what something called boundary objects, which are the material artifacts and the diagrams and the visuals that you uh, co-create within the team. And those are all important because they're reinforcing feedback. We know from studies of science teams that teams that work together through time, they get better at it. Um, 
as they get to know each other better, they get skill collaboration skills developed for working within a specific team. Um, and so that feeds back into the system. So there are some challenges that have been identified, uh, key challenges that have been identified. Uh, these are the seven that have been reported on most recently. Um, you can see that, uh, that some of these you have control over and some of them you don't in a team. Oftentimes the size of the team is dictated by the problem that you're trying to work on and people are distributed all over the place. But what we can work on is we can work on how we go about trying to integrate deep knowledge across diverse perspectives. So that's where I have focused my research. Uh, it starts in your mind. You may have many things you want to integrate, but it starts in your mind and it starts in trying to find these conceptual linkages across disciplines that are going to allow you to have a shared vocabulary and a shared research vision that then will dictate how you go about integrating all these other things. So the reality is that uh, language and communication and jargon are the absolute worst things for trying to do this. Uh, we all have our jargon and we all think that it's understood by everybody else. But the reality is that it's not. You really have to work together quite a while before you start understanding each other's vocabulary. So up until then, everybody, it's, I hear, see your mouth moving, but I don't understand a word you're saying. So we have to slow the process down and really explain our language and our vocabulary in order to pull this off. There are some ways not to do this. Uh, don't do an ad hoc process where you just throw everybody around the table. That almost never works. It just, the conversation goes on and on and on and on and never gets anywhere. Uh, the other thing people do a lot is seminars and that doesn't work either because uh, we, we give seminars like we're te talking to our peers when the people in the room that aren't from your discipline don't understand the webinar or the seminar. So uh, I do have a long line of grants working on this from, from NSF. And uh, the question of interest over the long haul has been, how can we more effectively engage across disciplines so that we can end up with these convergent outcomes? Uh, I use approach ca called model-based reasoning. Um, this has come out of the cognitive sciences. Uh, and it basically focuses on models as in mental models, what you have in your head and the use of external representations of that as a means of negotiating um, around complex subjects. Uh, studies of scientists have shown that they, do, they use model-based reasoning more than the general public does. So it's a skill that we learn to, uh, through, our, um, through our training. Uh, so a, a mental model means that, okay, we, you have things out in the real world, uh, might be technical things, you might have be a natural system, and you create this mental model in your head of, of how that system functions. And we think that we have very well organized mental models, but the reality is that our minds are really pretty messy. Uh, we have a lot of information and we know a lot of things that's very loosely connected. We draw on that information automatically and we never really structure it. So therefore, when we try to explain then our research, it's very hard to simplify our research into something someone else can understand. When we draw on all these concepts that we've pulled together over a lifetime uh, that, um, that support our deep disciplinary knowledge, but the other person doesn't have that, that, those, that background. They don't know the jargon, they don't have comparable mental models, uh, and so there's no perceived connections. And I would say that in the work that I've done, it is absolutely at its worst when you're trying to put a computer scientist with a natural scientist with a social scientist. If you're working within any of those three groups, it's not so bad because there's some shared background. But you know, most scientists, either on the social or the natural side, have never taken a computer science course. And vice versa, the social scientists don't take natural science beyond the core curriculum. So there's just not a lot of shared background um, when you start trying to do this. So because there's not a lot of shared background, everything is vague. 
uh, and ambiguous uh, and uncertain, and you don't know what direction to go that's going to integrate your research. So you get to end up with these dysfunctional teams. What happens is the two, two people on the team that are the most alike, they run, move forward with their shared vision. The poor social scientist is out there going, I don't have a clue how this fits with me. And then there, I've seen this way too many times, people just take their funding and they go back to doing whatever they were originally doing and they stop engaging on the team. When what you really want is to converge on a shared problem model that's not like any of the individual models. It's something new and different and draws on all of them. So the path to success, this is sort of a, a uh, uh, you know, um, practical way to do go about this. Make sure you have a lightly structured participatory process. I know uh, the, one of the early meetings with ISGO, you did the World Cafe. That's, that's an example of a lightly structured participatory process. Um, emphasize teaching and learning. Um, you're not, you're not going to generate research that very first meeting or the first few meetings. Those meetings have to be about learning, uh, teaching and learning each other's perspectives. Look for linkages, slow down, and if you find a linkage, take the time to explore it a little bit. Those are going to generate that cognitive system that's going to give you your emergence. Uh, co-create all sorts of visual representations, and I do mean co-create. I mean, go to the whiteboard and do it together. Don't just do it in advance and show your representation to everybody. These, are, these act as what's called boundary objects in the social sciences. And remember that shared vision emerges through time. Um, it's not going to happen immediately. And you have, to start, you have to really manage the expectations of the people in the group who are used to focusing immediately and generating a proposal in two weeks. So we are testing this model. We've got a, we got a whole set of theories and things that we're testing that I won't bother you with. Um, we've run some workshops with PhD students. These are 10 day workshops. They are extremely exhausting and intensive. Um, we've recruited students from across the US because we don't want them coming into the meeting knowing each other. So they're all, none of them know each other, and, but they're all working on water related projects. We're collecting all kinds of data in the workshops, including surveys and interviews, but also we're videotaping everything and doing recordings. I have a whole analytics team in Australia that's analyzing those data. Uh, one of the things that has come out of this, we have used this scale, it's a survey technique that uh, was developed for research teams. We do a pre and post workshop uh, survey of all of the students. Uh, and we have seen dramatic increases from the beginning to the end of that workshop in this survey scale, uh, especially with respect to conceptual skills and behaviors. So we know that this workshop and what we're doing with the model-based reasoning is really having a big impact on these students. We've also analyzed all those video recordings and everything, and we have a whole set of findings about process and how you manage the process effectively. One of the big important things that take homes has been that uh, whoever is leading the workshop, which is usually me, but not always, um, I really have to explicitly state, tell the students what things I'm doing to facilitate this, um, their activities um, and point it out to them. And they were do a lot of time, spend a lot of time reflecting on how, how what I did impacted them. And I have to model that behavior myself. Um, the other things, again, that have really come out are the importance of these diagrams, like the co-creation of diagrams. Um, and through the 10 days, we do diagrams all constantly, and we evolve them so that they get, you can think about spiraling in on a convergent idea, research idea. Um, so that's, I don't want to spend too much time there. I do have, there are some implications for education. Uh, in our data science paper that we wrote, we talked about the complexities of earth scientists and data scientists and them having to learn some about each other. But there's also these interdisciplinary teamwork competencies that we think are really important that need to be embedded in education. Uh, there are different models for doing that. Everything from on the left, two people 
two students not knowing anything about each other, but finding somebody that knows a little bit about both to connect them on to, all the way to the right where there have been proposals that, that people should be taught, uh, trained both in a discipline and in data science. But the reality is that, that the evidence doesn't support that we're able to do, do that in the context of a PhD program. Uh, most of us who have gotten depth in two disciplines have done it through experience. So conclusions, convergence across disciplines is extremely challenging. Um, and there's a decade of research on science teams that can help with that. There are many decades of research on learning that can help with that. Um, but transfer of those theories into practice when you're actually leading a team uh, is very difficult because oftentimes they run experimental tests and their outcomes with their findings are it's hard to figure out how to apply them in a real in the wild context um, but if we can figure out how to do that then we can we know we can train the next generation